Oh, for those of you that had a warning ahead of time that I was saying to ser- having a sermon today, thanks for showing up anyway. For those that didn't, didn't know, I guess, well, you get what you can take. But talk about a little bit of stress. I'm sitting over here. I wear hearing aids. For those of you who haven't figured out, I'm about as deaf as a guy can be. But I'm sitting over here and listening, and all of a sudden, boom, I can't hear out of that ear. And it's, oh, my goodness, it's what a terrible time to lose a hearing aid. Where you get, so you, if the stress level's up, I've got a little few beads of sweat across my head. That's what's going on. And by the way, old Steve, he named his boat Oops. I mean, I don't know if how many of you could see that from the back. The little boat that he was wearing. Said, Oops. I know about a lot of Steve's exploits in fishing. It's appropriately named, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> so the picture you see up there, how many of you have gold hand or gold mind in any way at all? How many of you guys, we've got quite a few hands up there. How, how, how many of you have gold bricked? You know what gold bricking is? <laughs> like staying home for work when you don't really need to stay home for work, you know, or, you're, or someone else has carried the load and you're kind of hanging back, not doing your thing. How many of you have gold brick? Oh, come on. Tell the truth. All right, good. <laughs> At least we've got one person here who's being honest about the thing. I think we've all done that from one time to the next. When Mary and I first moved out to the state of California, we came a couple of years ahead of time to visit. We came out to visit the Van Zands. And, you know, you always hear these things about gold in California, gold, gold, gold. And people that are not around gold have no idea what the real story is. So you get these false ideas in your mind. So we came out and we went up to Brandy Creek one day. We were out walking around having a little picnic. And the sun was just right. And we walked down into the creek in the English sun. I could see the glitter. And I knew that I had found the mother load. I said, oh, man, look. Hey, Dan, I called Dan and said, Dan, come look at this. There's gold all over the place down here. Of course, he knows, you know. He, but he's having a lot of fun with me, which he did over the years. He's always kind of had some fun with me. So he said, yeah, man. He says, wow. So I, I'm getting ready to scoop this stuff up, and he can't handle it anymore. He starts to laugh a little bit. He says, what's so funny? He says, that's fool's gold. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was, and there was a fool working on it. But anyway, so later, once I finally moved to California, I was always interested in gold panning a little bit, but I've always been what they call a recreational miner. That means someone that doesn't get really serious about it. You just kind of play around. And so when we went to Alaska on our recent trip, I thought, well, I'm going to take the gold pans along because there will probably be a few creeks and I will recreational mine a little bit. So this is a picture of me in one of the creeks down there, recreational mining. There we go. And so I had just a touch of gold fever while I was on the trip. Gold fever. But you know, there's another story. After we traveled around a little bit, my wife bought this book for me. We went to a place called Dawson City, which is where the Klondike gold strike was found in 1886. It was the last great, great stampede. You know, I had stampedes in California whenever the 49ers came through and the gold mine were found. Their gold was found all over the place there. So those stampeders kind of followed the gold and they went from place to place to place to place. Well, the last one, the last big one, was in Klondike. So we were there in Dawson City. I gold mined a little bit. Everywhere we went, I gold mined a little bit. In fact, I got to show you. I actually found some. I did. We were, there, I got to find it in my pocket here. We went out and uh, gold panned some. And if you guys do not believe me, it's, it's here. It's in this. And for those of you who want to see, I brought a magnifying glass. <laughs> because I'm, you know, even the water magnifies it some, but to really get, a, get an appreciation for the gold I found, you need a magnifying glass. But anyway, so <laughs> my wife bought this book for me. She knew that I was interested. I love history. You know, history has so much to teach us if you take the opportunity to look at it and apply it to your life. And so she bought this book, the Klondike. And uh, it gives the history, I mean, there are many of these out about the Klondike, but this particular individual, his father was one of the Stampeders, one of the original miners that came in on the Klondike. And so he was born in 1920. He lived in Dawson City, lived around this stuff. And so he was able to talk to some of those old miners and get some information direct from them. Sometimes, and that's another thing, 
I used to love to listen to my dad and his, his friends tell stories. I've always loved stories. Love stories because they can have so many things that, that you can learn by them. So when she gave me this book, I was, I think, four nights. It took me about four nights to go through it, but I, but I really enjoyed the book. So I'm going to share some of that with you today. And the reason why is because every story has an application on the spiritual side. You can take every story you hear and look at things that you can put together and bring about spiritual thoughts, spiritual conditions. And so we're going to move on, pick up my pieces. Don't, you know, you might want to, if the one of elders, another elder in, because I probably need someone to stay up here and guard this gold. Well, I don't, I'm going to have to turn my back and I don't want to make, I'm going to make sure it doesn't disappear. Okay, gold was discovered on a creek called Rabbit Creek. Later, they changed the name to Bonanza Creek. But the three fellows that were showing up here, Skokum, Taggart, Charlie, and the first one that went through was Carmack, George Carmack. Now, George Carmack and his Skokum Jim and Taggart, Charlie, were not really overly interested in gold. They were into logging at the time. They would, they would go up these creeks. They, there were logs everywhere, and there was a lot of timber that needed to be used in those days. And so these guys would go up and log this off, float it down to the creek, and head off. And every once in a while, just for fun, they'd stop and pan a little bit because no one really thought there was much gold in this area. So. On the day that gold was discovered, they came in at the top of Bonanza Creek. It's called, again, it was Rabbit Creek at the time, but they came in the top of the creek. I'll show you their path. The arrow will follow their path. They went along, they went to the dome and back down to another place. There was another fellow that had claimed that he found some gold earlier, and his name was Bob Henderson, Robert Henderson. Now, Robert Henderson was not, uh, uh, he was not the kind of guy that really liked the Indians very well. And so... Unfortunately, what had happened was John, uh, George Carmack had married an Indian, and Skookum Jim was his brother-in-law, and Taggart Charlie was another Indian, which was the nephew. And so they were with George, and when they went over to see what uh, uh, Robert Henderson told them that they had, he had found some gold over there, so they were going to go over and take a look at it. And he was just antagonistic to the Indians establishing a claim and George said well you know we can find there's got to be in other places if you don't want us around here if you don't like our company we're out of here well in those days generally when a miner found some gold they spread the word they find something tell everybody that hey there's gold down here and so uh, Bob Henderson had been telling people about the gold and he really didn't find that much it's a fairly decent claim and when George looked at it, he said uh you know, you really don't want us filing here, we'll move on somewhere else. And so what they ended up doing is they left that spot and went back down the uh, Bonanza Creek and right along that area where the arrow is now, they stopped for a break. And uh, there's several different stories about who actually found the gold. You know, George claims that he found it. Uh, Skookum Jim claims that he found it. Whoever found the gold, Long and short of it, someone found the gold there, found a huge nugget, and they started plying through the creek, and more and more nuggets came out. Well, all of a sudden, they're excited about gold, forgot about the logs, and George had a shotgun shell, 12-gauge shotgun shell, shell, and he filled the shell with gold nuggets, and he filled it quickly, and he staked his claim. Now, in those days, I don't know what the laws are there now, but in those days, you could stake a finder's claim. If you find gold somewhere, you could stake up to 500 foot length on the creek and from ledge to ledge on each side. So if you were the finder of the, of the uh, first gold, you could stake two claims, one as a finder's claim and then the other for yourself personally. So they ended up staking four claims, say two for George, one for Skokum Jim, the other one for Taggart Charlie. Now the way they would mark out claims is the number of one claim is a zero claim. Then each claim up is one above, one above, one, or one below, and they number them that way. 
So when you go into the mining office, you have to tell him, I'm staking, this is where I'm staking my claim, and, and you file the claim, and, and pretty much you're in charge of it. Now, you have to work that claim. You can't just go in there and file it and then forget it. So you have to stay with it. So these guys, uh, they're headed back out. They're, they're excited now. They found the goal. We've got to tell. Everyone they saw, they would tell. Now, the thing about good old George, George was a guy who tended to stretch truth a little bit. He would always crank things around to his benefit, you know. Yeah, uh, he claimed that he had found a lot more things than he had. So when he comes into town and he's shooting his mouth off about this goal that I found, nobody believes him. No, I say, you're just, you know, this is Lion George, Lion George. Well, George pulls out the shotgun shell and shows the goal. Well, first person he says is, well, there must be something to it. So they take off up to file a claim. Heads on into town, goes into the bar, buys drinks for everybody. You know, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the town today. The town wasn't that, that much, but there are a few tents. And eventually it came a huge tent city before there were actually some buildings erected in uh, Dawson City. But George goes over into town, takes his, gun, his shotgun shell, dumps it out on the scale, and everybody's like, well, they're saying George is lying. Someone has set George up. The guy that's trying to build this city has given George some gold so that everyone will come in. Because what happens is when the notice of a strike takes place, word spreads. I mean, they, did, they didn't have television. They didn't have the internet, all those things in those days. But word would spread like wildfire. Gold strike, gold strike. So it was real easy for people to be working right now. That, that, that when George came in, the present uh, uh, gold fields were in what they call 40 Mile Creek. A 40 mile creek was, was uh, about 40 miles away from Dawson City, something close to that, 35, 40 miles. But as soon as the word goes, as soon, if the mine's played out, if the, if the gold is getting a little thin, then everyone takes off to the next place. All excited for it, and they're going. And so whenever George came in and started telling everyone about the gold, a lot of them thought it was, he was in collusion with a fellow who was trying to develop Dawson City to get everyone to move from 40 mile to Dawson City. So the only way that he finally, finally the most of them believed him was there was a surveyor who had surveyed all the land around there, really had the knowledge of it, and he looked at the goal and he said, he said, you know, one thing about the goal, the miners who really are, are up to the speed on what's going on around here, they can tell you which creek coal came out of. You can show them a handful of gold that came out of different creeks, and they can actually pick out which creek, which area the gold came from. So they showed this gold, they, they showed this gold on the shotgun shell, they showed this gold to the, the, the surveyor, and he says, it didn't come from any creek I have surveyed. But it's got to come from somewhere. Well, that was enough for them. So, boy, they're gone. They're headed out there. You know, people are leaving the town and starting the empty before the month was over, in fact, probably about before the week was over, all the claims along that whole creek were staked. People had gone crazy. Gold fever for sure. And the gold that's found there, the client's known as Klondike gold. Now, it took a while before the gold was actually brought out of there. I mean, people that, uh, we just traveled to Alaska. That's a big place. And we were driving a vehicle, you know, in those days, there were several routes that they, they could go up. Uh, you know, most of the time it was dog sled, most of the time. Uh, but these guys had found the gold. They started mining the gold. Um, I don't know if many of you know what permafrost is, but permafrost is a section of the ground. It can be pretty thick at times. It never really thaws out because you have a lot of cold weather up there. So gold tends to lie not on the surface, but gold will work its down, weigh it down to bedrock. Bedrock is deep. Bedrock is the bottom of the creek. And so in order to get to the big gold, they had to melt through. They had to get down past this permafrost. And they would build fires on top of the permafrost and burn them way down. Each day it burned a little bit. They'd shovel off the cold, burn some more, burn some more until they could dig down. So it took a while to get the large amount of gold out of the area. So it was about almost one year, July the 14th, 1897, so almost a year before they got the gold uh, loaded up, got, got it set up to move out, and 
on that day, July 14, 1897, the Excelsior beat another ship. Excelsior was going into San Francisco. Another ship, I forgot the name, was going into Portland. They had a load of gold on them. Word had gotten out to some extent, but it was still, you know, no gold had really come in to the big ports. And so it's still a question about what's there. Well, you can see the crowd of people gathered around here. When the word came that these ships were coming in loaded with gold, everybody gets excited about this thing. And this actually started the stampede because word went out that gold was lying around like apples on the ground. All they have to do is get up there and walk around and pick the things up. So gold fever struck everywhere, worldwide. It went crazy. People were coming in. There were uh, some one million people estimated that had made plans to go in, try to get into uh, file claims. Now... Only 100,000 were really took off. And of those 100,000 that took off to make the trip, only 40,000 actually got in there. Of the 40,000 that actually got in, only about 4,000, and these are round numbers, really found some gold. But the fever struck. Merchants were going absolutely crazy because here's money. Gold, these guys want this equipment. They're wanting to go to these places. They, it's nuts. So there was battles going on. The newspapers of each city, the big, large city, we're promoting gold from there. This is the best place to go. This is the easiest way. This is the cheapest route. Da, 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 da. All those stories. Clothiers were putting together. People love to dress like someone. You know, it still happens today. In a movie star, uh, some, someone important, everybody wants to look kind of like them. So the clothiers were just supplying all kinds of clothes for this. From the merchant standpoint, these guys were making lots of money. And they were selling these gold miners all kind of things that they didn't really need. Now, the routes, you had three main routes that were used, actually four main routes that were used in this. The one, as you see the red dot move along, the red dot is going to show you the, the water route was called the rich man's route because the guy, it took a lot of money for a guy to be able to take that route. But you didn't have to cross the mountains. You didn't have to do anything but ride the boat up to St. Michael once you got to St. Michael, there was another 60 miles that you ended up having to go uh, to get to Yukon River. Now, it was 1,900 miles, give or take, and I've read a number of different reports. One says 18, one says 2,000, but somewhere around 1,900 miles to get into Dawson City. Now, once into Dawson City, they were in with thousands and thousands of people pouring in in a tent city. I mean, these are all tents, and this was built on a... a about swamplands, basically what it was built on. The other route uh, was the Canadian route. Now, the Canadians tried to push that because you didn't have to go through American customs. One of the things that happened for a miner, if a miner went through Canadian territory, he had to pay a tax for all his equipment he brought in. And if a Canadian went through American territory, so they were trying to avoid going through each other's territory as much as possible to save on the tax. But Canadian route, the, the uh, went from Edmonton up along through Pelly River and ended up in Dawson. And then the final route, which is actually two that went out of Seattle, one of them was going through the Chilkoot Pass, the other was from Skagway. I don't know how many of you heard of the name Skagway, but both Skagway and Daia, uh, which were close together, those were the main two places where the gold miners were heading out. Some 22,000 of the gold miners left from that area and went for. Now, I'm going to talk more about the Chilkoot Pass today because, again, that was the one that was the most, most uh, used. And it was open year round. The White Horse Pass, up until they put, uh, uh, that's the one on Skagway, until they opened the railway through there, the White Horse Pass was not open year round. And so people had a very short period of time when they had to go. So Chilkoot Pass in Daia was a place, a boarding place. Now, this is Daia Port, 1898. These pictures were, there was a fellow that was in there that took a lot of pictures, black and white pictures in those days, because he wanted to, to uh, uh, you know, he wanted to catalog this information so he could pass it down. Newspaper people were in there. A lot of folks were in reporting on this. When you come into Daia Port, the ships would come in, and the, the Canadians had required that you have a thousand pounds, um, excuse me, a ton of, of equipment, which included food, clothing, everything, because what had happened is the year before, 1886, when they had a lot of people moving that direction, a lot of folks didn't have enough supplies, and they'd end up in uh, Dawson City. They couldn't make it. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough clothes. 
as soon as as soon as they heard the word they started moving that direction so the Canadians said we're not going to have that we're going to require that you have sufficient food for one year so they had a list they gave everyone a list to pass out those things and you had to make sure that you had that when you came into the to Canadian customs when you checked in if you didn't have enough they'd turn you back so these guys would come in and when the the, another interesting thing, that happened, there's so many interesting things on this, I'm going to miss a few of them, but I'm, I'm trying to crowd them in so I don't keep you here forever. But there were so many ships bringing people in, they were putting equipment back into service that had been mothballed. It was not even seaworthy, but the opportunity was there to make some money. So they were putting, and they started dumping these people in on this port. And the interesting thing about the port is the ships would come in uh, usually they'd come in and I don't know why they didn't come in on high tide but they normally come in on low tide they dump everything out off on the beach and each person has a ton of equipment if they don't move this before the water comes in all their money that all of that's just gone because the seawater would just destroy it so many men never made it beyond this port because once they got to this to uh, place of offloading their food uh, and, their, and their supplies they were not able to get it moved fast enough before the, the high water came in. So the first problem they ran into was there. The first few miles from Dahlia Trail were deceptively easy. A pleasant wagon road rambled along through the meadow and forest. Beyond the five mile mark, travelers had to pass through Dahlia River Canyon, two miles long, 50 feet wide, and is cluttered with boulders, torn up trees, and masses of roots. Now, this picture shows some people coming out of the Dahlia Canyon. If you look in behind them, you get an idea of what the past was, and again, you know, these, uh, if you're sitting very far back, you might not be able to get a picture of it, but the past was very narrow, and because of the nature of the past, boulders would fall down into the very, very narrow area, trees would fall down, there was all kinds of debris in there, and so when they go through with pack horses, pack or animals of any kind, it's extremely difficult, because there was not enough room, a lot of times the animals would have to step down, you know, as they're walking through, they have to step down between the fallen trees and rocks and stuff. And generally, by the time they made it through the end of the uh, pass, the horses weren't, or the animals weren't worth very much because most of them were bruised up and pretty, pretty well damaged. Well, it didn't make any difference to the miners. All they cared about was getting an animal through there. They would pay, they were paying up to $700 for horses that were broken down. And I mean, in those days, that's a lot of money. They were paying that to, just to get a horse to haul the equipment through, didn't care what happened to them. On the alternate one, which is uh, the White Horse Pass going out of Skagway, there's a, there's a section there called Dead Horse Pass, and it was named that because so many horses died in the process of trying to pack the gold, uh, not the gold, but the, the supplies, in the process of doing that, that animals upon animals upon animals, and the snow would come in, cover the animals up, and people would climb right across them. There was one, one instance that was extremely... You know, a, a, a pack horse died in the middle of the pass, and this fellow was saying that in the morning I saw this happen. He was with a reporter. At the end of the day, there was nothing left but one end of the horse, each end of the horse, because the people walked right over the horse. I didn't even stop because they have a short period of time to get over the pass and get in for the goal. So they're moving on. They're not letting anything stop them back. Once out of the canyon, the terrain began to rise towards the base of the mountain. Stampeders could rest there in a makeshift town called Sheep Camp before tackling the four-mile ascent to the 3,500 feet of Dyea, uh, the, the uh, mountain that rose 3,500 feet of Dyea. This is Sheep Camp. These makeshift camps were put together. Again, people who thought they could make some money off of the uh, miners coming through there, the stampeders, they were more than happy to do that. So you could buy just about anything that you want. I mean, anything you wanted to buy there. And a lot of, a lot of people would would spend a couple of days more than they needed to there. But when they moved on from sheep camp, the trail rose sharply to an angle of 35 degrees, and a man could drop to his knees and still seem like he was standing up. Pack animals were generally unable to compete complete the final portion of the ascent, so approximately one ton of required supplies had to be carried on the backs of the owners or by packers. Now, I don't know how well you can see where that pass goes. Right there is where the pass starts, where I'm pointing... And it doesn't appear to be four miles from this vantage point. But from that camp up, that's four miles that they have to go up. These guys are carrying, they have, again, they have to pack 1,000 pounds over. The average man can only carry about 50 pounds. 
And these guys are packing this stuff on their backs, headed up to the top of that mountain. And, and you'll see that they're one right after the other. You didn't want to lose your place in line. If you lose your place in line, you may stand there for hours or days trying to get back in because no one's willing to give you a spot. This is a pretty crowded thing. Now, some, in, some gentlemen who were, uh, uh, thought they'd make a little extra money carved some, uh, at first they carved about 15 or 20 steps out of the ice, hacked it out, and they were charging guys uh, eight bucks a shot to climb up these golden stairs. Eventually, there were 1,500 of those because everybody thought it was a good idea to make some money off someone else. So they ended up hacking these things. There were 1,500 stairs, and I said golden stairs earlier. It wasn't called golden stairs to start with, but after, after the 1,500, they called it the golden stairs. And so these guys would pay money, hike on up this to the top. Once they got to the top, the average man could only carry about 50 pounds per trip. So it took better part of three months to transfer all their supplies to, from Daya, Daya to uh, Lake Linderman. What they would end up doing, they would divide their, their, their equipment up, they would carry about 50 pounds a shot, then at the top of the mountain, they'd sit down on their backside, pull their left, and slide back down. It'd take about two minutes to get back down. And they had to keep completing that until they got all their supplies to the top. From there, the Stampeders would purchase or build boats. That's when they finally got to Lake Linderman. Lake Linderman was another about 13 miles or so past the summit, uh, uh, Chilkoot Summit. And so these guys would, once they, they made the pass, got all their supplies up, then they'd have to start down. They would head down to this lake, and the lake, uh, uh, it was part of the, it led into the Yukon River. And in order to finish the trail, the last... 500 miles. They had to make boats. They had to put it, all their supplies together. So, the title of the sermon today was All In. All In. These guys that made, decided to make the trip and actually made it, they were all in. And where, where does that term come from? Well, Nobody, in, no, 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 none of you Adventists know anything about what this is. I mean, these, these are poker chips to the un, unknowledgeable here. But all in is a phrase that means you have evaluated a situation and you're going to put all your chips in it. You're going to put everything you have into it. All in. These guys that headed off on this trip have put all in. Now, the interesting thing is along the way, a lot of them found out that they had a lot more than they needed. And as the trail got difficult, they started discarding these unnecessary items. And many of the merchants would come in and they, they would find these discarded items and they'd take them back and sell them to the next group coming through. There was another notorious character at the Skagway, which is a story all in itself. And his, his, his name was Soapy Smith. Soapy had men, scouts everywhere, and they would mingle with the new guys coming in, found out who actually had some money and who was there on the shoestring. And they would manipulate their way into the favor of those people and offer their money, they would go. Anyway, he was primarily based in Skagway. So all in, these guys were all in when they took off. Like I said earlier, we'll move past that, but one million made plans to go. 100,000 started the trip, 40,000 completed the trip. Only 4% found gold. And here's where we put the scripture. You can always put the scripture together with a story to get yourself an important point. Those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and themselves as well. Jesus Christ expects you to be all in. He wants you to be all in. That doesn't mean that you keep a little in reserve. That doesn't mean you hold back your choice. It means everything. Counting the cost, he says, if one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and figure, oop, move back too fast there, too many clicks. One of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and figure out what it will cost and you see if you have enough money. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation and all that see it. 
see what happened, we'll make fun of you. You began to build and couldn't finish, they'd say. And again, if a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight, a, fight another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he's strong enough to face it, the other king. If he isn't, he will send messengers to meet the other king and ask for terms of peace. Counting the cost. Jesus expected people to count the cost. He thought that would be the common process. I don't think that happens much today. It seems to me that a lot of people will wander out into some situation and not realize that there's a consequence for every action. Maybe a good consequence, maybe a bad consequence, but there is a consequence for every action. Those of you who are, are married for a lot of years, uh, we had a bunch of people up on the, on the stage here some months ago, and uh, there was people who had been married for a long time. Anyone in that group, I'm one of the guys in the group, anyone will tell you that you cannot go into a relationship and have a successful relationship if both partners aren't all in. It doesn't work. One person can't carry the whole load in that. You have to be all in. If some of you out there are dating, you're thinking about, oh, okay, this, is this the right person? going to be the next one. Talk it out before it ever happens. If you're not all in, if you're just kind of thinking about it, you're not really committed, don't waste your time. Same thing with raising kids. <laughs> you know, anyone who thinks raising children is a light responsibility are either too old to remember or they don't have any kids. You cannot do it efficiently, effectively, unless you're all in. The Bible says to train up a child in the way they should go. Training. Training, training. I've got a German Shepherd dog. I, I train him to do a lot of things. It takes constant effort. It is not. If you're not willing to be all in, get yourself a cat. The reason I say the cat is because cats are easier to handle. You get a dog, you still have to put, you know, but cats are they're, they're kind of, they do their own thing. But if you're not all in, don't raise a bunch of kids, raise cats. Because any of you here, even your young parents, you know it's a very great responsibility. All in. All in. In the same way, this is the end of the verse that Jesus concluded again in regard to from the religious aspect. None of you can be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. If I had ra asked you before I started this, the message, if I had asked you, raise your hands if you consider yourself to be a disciple of Christ, my thought would be that most of you would raise your hand. Some by conviction, some by because the next guy to you is raising his hand. But anyway, when you look at what the Scripture says about what Christ expects out of you, I'm sorry, I fail. I personally have missed the mark time and time and time again. Because like those miners who are climbing up the hills, I want to read you one. I, I'm, I'm sorry to keep you so long in this thing, but some of this stuff is really... This is a message about those guys that were climbing. You saw the picture of them climbing up the 35-degree hill. Up the golden stairs they went, the men from the farms and the offices, climbing into the heavens, struggling to maintain the balance of the weight upon their shoulders, occasionally sinking to their hands and knees, but always rising up again, sometimes breaking down and collapse, sometimes weeping in rage and frustration, yet always striving higher and higher. And that's what I feel about my Christian relationship with the Lord is a struggle, is a struggle at times. Other times, easy going. But the, what you want to hear, what I want to hear in my relationship, yet always, always striving higher and higher. And to do that, you've got to be all in. Paul, Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, I have finished the course I have kept the faith. Paul, who had many things to brag about at the end of his life, 
A lot of things he could say. I've started churches all over the place. I wrote up lots of books. I, I, have, I have done everything that I can for Christ. His words are, I have kept the faith. People, the most difficult thing that you will experience in your Christian life is keeping the faith. Sam, please come forward now. And the last song is All the Jesus I Surrender. You have to keep at it. <laughs>